Um, I'm assuming that's what everyone's here for is learning Python. Um, so this talk is Py, uh, Py, Python 101, and we're going to be covering the basics of you know, why you should be using Python, why uh, Python's a, cr a great language to use, uh, what makes it powerful, and how it can apply to several different applications. Um, out, not only like web applications, but also like, um, like personal projects if you need to write a script um, to just parse through a file to show you information off a website or anything, anything at all really. Python's pretty powerful. It's also, an, it's a higher level language like Ruby um, and uh, like C++ and Java. So it's, it, takes, uh, it takes your code and it interprets it. It's, a, it's an interpretive language. So if you've ever used a Linux computer or Mac computer, uh, when, you're, when you're using a terminal, you're using Bash, which is also an interpretive uh, language as well. So when you type something in, your code's being executed immediately. You're not having to wait for it to save to a file, then throw it through a compiler, and then wait for, that, for the, uh, the execute code to show some output or, or handle your data. Uh, so as soon as you type in code, it's valid. Um, or not valid, but it, it processes it immediately. Um, one of the advantages of Python uh, code that I'll be going over and I'll be showing as well is Python, and this is why I believe Python should be, or Python is a, a great language. It's very easy to read. It's very English-like. Uh, a lot of the syntax was designed to make the code very uh, readable by other people. So if you're working on a project and you want someone else to come up to it, they can take a look at it and they'll, they should be able to very easily understand what it is because a lot of it will almost form English-like sentences. Uh, a lot of your comparisons can be done in using uh, English operators instead of using weird uh, symbol operators. Like if you're, if you're familiar with Perl, you, you have an array of goofy characters. Uh. Okay, sorry about that. I did not know I had time out. Sorry, I must apologize. This is not not my laptop. It's the third laptop we had to go through to get a display on the projector. So. I'm not entirely too familiar with this system, but as far as Python goes, Python's pretty much the same everywhere as long as you're using the same version, which that's another thing I should bring up real quickly. Is that uh, I'm, here I'm using Python 2.6.6. On most distri Linux distributions, when you install Python, it, or when you install a distribution that comes with some type of Python, most of your distributions nowadays have some dependencies on Python. For example, if you run Fedora, Yum depends on Python. Actually, Yum was entirely written on Python. So if you're in Python, you can actually import Yum and call methods off of it. And you can actually essentially add new features to it or even fork a project and make your own package manager from it, which is pretty nifty. Um, I actually wrote a script once that handled output from Yum. And it was very easy to do because Yum's Python. You could just simply you know, import Yum if you're on a Fedora system. Um, another advantage of Python has a huge standard library, very powerful. You can, uh, if there's something you'd like to do, there's most likely a standard library for it, or someone's created a project that you can, that they put on GitHub, Google Code somewhere, uh, Gitaris, and you can just download it, and uh, it, you can treat it as a library, essentially. So it, there's a lot of, a vast majority of things you can use. In fact, there's a, a Google Voice one where you can actually send text messages using, uh, Google Voice, you just need to store in, uh, you're using a password. Well, I actually prompts for your password, but someone wrote uh, the, the library. It's on Google Code. I think Google wrote it. I forget who officially authored it, but it's, it's, one, it's one nifty thing about Python is you just import Py Google Voice uh, once you download it and essentially just write text messages, check your voicemail, and you can essentially create like your own server to you know, ping and check for information, do it back with your text messages. So Python's really powerful in that respect. A um, few things about the actual syntax. Python is dynamic and strong, um, which means that the dynamic, uh, dynamic means that you can't, uh, the, the, type, the type checking isn't done until you actually run your code. Other languages like C++, the type checking is done when you run through a compiler. And what I mean by types is you have like an integer, a boolean, uh, strings, different types of uh, variables. Uh, and then strong just means that uh, you can't mix different types. So you can't add an integer to a string. You can't uh, subtract uh, a string from a list or an array, essentially. So you, you can't do it. So that's just a quick classification about Python. And then uh, some common uh, uh, programming paradigms that are used in Python 
is what's called the Zen of Python. And if you run a Python interpreter, if you just do import this, it'll show a list of everything that uh, um, I believe it was uh, Tim Peters. Uh, I believe it was his name. It should be listed up here. Um, let's see here. All right. Well, I'm not going to try to fiddle with that. I, but uh, it essentially describes about like what's preferred in Python around the philosophy and what you should be doing with Python. Um, one big uh, thing, and it's kind of a disadvantage to some people who are coming from the Perl world, is that Python uh, is that there's preferably only, uh, only one way to do something, and it's usually obvious how to do it. Whereas in Python or Perl, it's Tim Toady, where it's there's more than one way to do it, and you can write one line of code in probably about an infinite number of ways, and they you know allow that powerfulness behind Perl. Uh, in Python, we try to make it um, very, very fluid, very, try to make it more intuitive, more English-like, more, more easy to adapt to different situations. So someone, you can essentially write a code and pass off libraries, essentially, and people could take that and uh, use it. Um, one of the, the, since this is a tutorial talk, one of the tutorials uh, I'm working on, I'm going to state the project name, so if anyone who wants to follow along could go ahead and start working on it. And I already have the code written up, and I'll show you the code I came up with it. But the idea is, uh, if, is anyone here familiar with the birthday problem? Or the birthday paradox? I don't know if it's a paradox. But it's, uh, it's, a, it's a statistic, uh, I don't know if it's right here, but it's a statistical analysis that says that if you take a room full of X number of people, after you hit a certain number of people, there's a, you can define what the chance of someone, of two people sharing the same birthday. And I believe after t at 23 people, you have a 50-50 odds of two people in the room sharing the same birthday. Hey, let me interrupt just one quick second. Mm -hmm. um, extension cores and power strips, in, in case if anyone needs them for their laptops, you know, so they can continue to work. All of a sudden, back here, you just put them wherever. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. All right. Um, but uh, the birthday problem, tw uh, 23 people in the room, should be a 50-50% odds that two people share the same birthday. Um, the idea of the, the tutorial is that you build a script that simulates different rooms of people. You define how much people are in each room and how many rooms you want to test. And then you calculate out what the statistic should be and what the statistic actually is from random generated data, essentially. And you generate your own people and the birthdays. Um, it's pretty nifty. If you love statistics, you might find it very interesting. But that's kind of the goal of the tutorial. Uh, is to walk through that and uh, to create that. And, it, and more so, it's going to be about learning a language, and then I'll div uh, deviate a little bit and pull up the, the actual file I've written and uh, show you uh, the things I've in explained and how it relates to how it's usable in the script itself. Um, first, oops. All right. So, all right. The first uh, thing about the syntax, or about the actual language itself, is the different data types. I briefly touch on this. In Python, you have a few basic data types. You have what's called a list, you have a string, you have a dictionary, uh, and you have an int, and you have a float, you have a boolean, and you can actually find out the type of any variable or any information you have by just using the global function type. So if I create a, a string, let's say a hello, hello world, and then I want to know what the type is, I can just do type A, and it tells me it's a string, str, essentially. So that's an example of how, if you, if you, have, if you have an object, um, and you have no idea what type it is, and you want to know how to interface with it, you always do type. Another thing you do on a, an object, if, you have, if you're not sure what it does, you can also do a global function called dir, and it will show you all available methods you can call off that class. Uh, most people here, I would, uh, I'm hoping are, at least have heard of object-oriented programming. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with that, the idea is everything in, in the language is an object, essentially. And you can call methods off of it. You can uh, you essentially call methods off of it. You can do uh, different inheritance. You can build on different objects. And it makes it a lot easier because with object-orientedness, you can uh, abstract your code and make it a lot more portable. So that way you're not having to uh, essentially reinvent the wheel in several different spots. And that's why classes are so important, because you can actually create your own objects for complex, that represent complex 
data or complex systems, essentially. So like if you want to make a representation of a car, you can create class car to represent a car. Um, but that's about your uh, different data types. Um, like I said, you have uh, lists, strings, ends, booleans, and uh, what you can do with those, uh, you, can, you can create those. So like in most languages, you can do, uh, let's say, my list and, well, actually, the output of dir is a list itself. And actually, I should back up real quick. I'm using what's called IPython, um, which is the interpreter. Um, most, on most machines, you could just run Python, and you'll get an interpreter. And you can just type in your code and go about testing Python. Um, I'm using IPython mostly because it makes it easier to do uh, tab completion for methods off of classes. P the standard Python thing is available on most distributions. If not installed array, you can find it through the repositories. IPython, you most likely have to get through the repositories. So for aptitude, it's just IPython. I believe for Fedora, it's the same thing. But it's a lot more helpful for tab completion if you're, unfamiliar, if you're in an unfamiliar environment and you want to tab complete methods off of classes and objects, which makes it a lot easier and faster to code, in my opinion, for when testing stuff out. Um, so let's pull that back up. Yeah, I already see down here. Okay, so as I was talking about assigned variables, a string is just your hello world, and then you do my list, and then a list, like I said, it was just, you have your square bracket, you have A, B, and C, and you create a list. There. There's only supposed to be one square bracket. All right. It's running kind of slow here. All right. Nope. Yeah. Backspace on a Mac doesn't actually backspace, does it? Okay, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Command backspace, okay. You can tell how often I use a, I use a Mac. <laughs> All right, so you create a list. It's essentially, a list is, in Python is essentially an array in most other languages, so it's an ordered uh, group of elements, essentially. So you have your first item A, which is zero, your zeroth identifier B, which is your first one, C, and this example is your second one. So if I did my list uh, zero, I'll pull out A. And if I did my list, Two, I'd get C. And you can also do uh, negative one to get the last element, and you can also do negative two to get the second last element. And the reason I bring up lists first is, uh, or arrays essentially, is because there's kind of like this sneaky little thing or convention that kind of slightly carried over from C, so C++, is that if you've ever done C work, you don't technically have strings. You just have to keep making arrays of characters and make sure you put your null terminator at the end. Um, so with that, that, that kind of somewhat carries over to Python because strings are treated like <coughs> lists or arrays in Python, which can be very useful, especially when you get into uh, splicing, which well, what I mean by splicing is if you've ever had to like pull out a substring from a certain position to a second position, and I believe in I believe it's in PHP, you have to define the number with one function call, and then you have to like pass like, like the first variable, and then what you want to replace, not with, no, that's a replacement, but it, it's, you have to provide all the numbers, and it's, you have to pass out three variables for it, whereas Python, you can actually do this, uh, the substring matching within, uh, with, within the accessor. I don't know why the word accessor almost slipped my mind. So, so for, where is it, my list. So the variable A equals hello world. So if I just wanted to, let's say, print, let's say index, what is it, that'd be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six to the end. I could do A, six, and it would just show world. So essentially what this is doing is you get your six, that's the zero base, index where you're starting at, and then the colon just means go to the end. So essentially what this is reading, it's reading as, um, or, yeah, so it's, it's reading it as six colon and another number, but it's using the length of the string as a hidden number. 
Um, and then you can change the second number essentially. So the first number before the colon is where you're starting at, and then the second number is where you're ending at, and, and what you want to display out of the string. And the reason this is important is because strings of Py uh, or in Python, strings and lists kind of go hand in hand. Um, but the difference is strings are immutable, which means you cannot change different indexes inside the string, but you can with a list. So what I mean by that is if I go back to the example of my list, so I have ABC, I can do something like this where I want to change the first element and I want to say foo. So if I print my list, I get you know, A through C. Um, so with, with this example, I can change different elements in a list. A list is not static. It's not a constant. I, I can dynamically change that. Whereas there's a string on the other hand, if I did A, you know, I want to change that to, let's say, a capital B. You can't do that. And it'll tell you, you know, string object does not support item assignment. But the fancy word for this is it's immutable, which means that you can't change those objects. And the same thing with a set, too. A set is a static list. And the different syntax for that is you just use uh, parentheses instead of your square brackets. So if you did like my list two, you do A and Z. And then to demonstrate that that's immutable, if I did, can't do it. Well, technically it's a tuple, but I call this. Some people, when you look at the documentation, uh, well, when you look at Python documentation, they call it a tuple, but if you look at some blogs, they'll call it a set. People inter inter interchange the word, so it's technically a tuple in the Python world. So a tuple object does not support item assignment, same error as we saw before. In uh, simpler terms, it's immutable, so you can't change those, those values in there. Um, so you, you, you can keep, you, you can sets are essentially the same thing as a list, they're just static. So they're very useful. So the only, when you want to use a set, like if you're writing over something, there's a chance you might accidentally overwrite something in your code, you might want to use a set. Or if you're pulling in information from a URL, for example, that would be important as well. Um, and then for listener arrays. Um, so arrays, you can also treat them like a, like a stack, essentially. So you can do like a dot pop, and you can do a dot append, and there's uh, several other methods of science so you can do similar operations. So let's, if we go back to my list example, we have A foo C, and then you could do pop, and then we can say, well, you know, what's at the, the end of it? And now end is C, but the pop, it will actually move that from my list. So now my list no longer has, this, has that last element, essentially. Now if I want to put it back, you can do append, which some other languages they'll use push instead, which just puts it back at the end of uh, at the end of the array. So you can do my list append C. And, well, oops, yeah. So and the append changes the list in place because it's a method off of that list essentially. <coughs> um, yeah, and then same thing with pop. It's a method off of it. So this is going back to your object orientatedness. Uh, the the dot pop is a method call off of the class that represents my list, or off that object. I shouldn't use, really use the word class because it's an instantiated class, technically. Um, so yeah, that, that's your lists. Um, and then strings, uh, like I said, you, it was just you know A equals, or your variable name equals, and then your quotes. Another thing, and this is kind of like a little different than like C++, so if I did, uh, you can also use single quotes, and that, will still work. It's not specific. You can also do um, you do triple single quotes or you can do triple double quotes as well. And the nifty thing about that is if you're writing, if you're doing this inside a file, Python technically does not have multi-line comments like other languages do. Where in C++ you have the forward slash star. In Python you would just use three single quotes your first line, second line, third line, and then just end whenever you're done with you know the matching three quotes there. So, kind of an advantage of uh, of doing that is it's technically if you're doing a multi-line comment that way, it's technically an, uh, it's a non-assigned string. So you're creating a string, you're just not assigned to a variable, and that's technically valid in Python because it's still legal code. You don't have to make a data set and assign it to anything 
really you could just throw it in there but it's you're not going to be able to access it later essentially because you don't know what to call it by because it technically no longer exists or well it exists but you can't access it essentially okay. make sure the screen doesn't go out on me um, and also with strings as well strings are has the, the difference between strings and lists besides being immutable is that you uh, with Python that a lot of times in other languages you might have to write a function to let's say like split or uh, or you know f well not really split most languages have a split or a dot find or like a replace but in Python so with uh, where's a a equals hell work if I want to replace the word uh, world with someone's name you could do world and I could say oops Mike but it doesn't change in place you have to assign that back to a new variable so if you want to overwrite you do a replace right and then now it would change and you essentially replace the world with Mike um, there's split as well and splits what's really powerful about split is it assumes a lot initially when you don't call with parameters. So if I did a dot split, oops, I need to close my parentheses there. I it splits on all non. It splits on all white space characters. So if you have tabs, spaces, uh, any other non. If you any other white space characters, it would split on those. So you can intermix those essentially, and it would just throw those all out and split on every occurrence that sees one. And you would end up with, and well, at least in this example, since I only had one space, I end up with hello Mike. Uh, you, with, the dot, with the dot split, you can specify what you want to split on, and you just provide it. So if I want to split on exclamation points, for example, it would return everything up to that, and then what's after it. And since there's technically nothing after it, it ends with the second element. And the return result here is a list as well. Um, so, and then you can, you know, loop over that, which that's what I'm getting to next is, and this is what I find, what, this is what I, in my opinion, I think is really powerful about Python is it's for loops compared to other languages, um, where you can, you can loop easily over arrays very, or I should say lists. You can loop over lists very easily. So, for example, um, where is it? The import info info.county. So I have this file called info. And what it is is it's info.counties. It's, it's a list I have set up in another file. And the way I did in, import info is I have a file called info.py. And you can import the other Python files. And any type of data you have in there. So my, I just have a variable. Well, actually, I'll just open it up to show you what's in there. So I have a file in there. And I should probably mention the shebang line at the top is your uh, is technically a comment, um, and it's telling when you run it as an executable, it tells you where to find the Python interpreter. This is a bit general. It's just saying whatever your environment variable is for Python, just use that. A lot of a lot of your more legacy code that needs like an older version of Python, you'll see like slash user slash bin slash Python like two four, or specify like a different path for Python. But this is just generally using the if you use the slash user bin envy, it's going to use whatever path when you do which Python in your terminal. Um, so that, that, that's just a general way to do it. And then I'm, I, I'm not using those to import things. Those were just kind of left over. But the, the counties is a list, and it's listing all the counties in Ohio in alphabetical order. So you can scroll through here. And I also have states, which is a dictionary, which I'll get into that here in a little bit. But I'm going over the lists first. And then this is just uh, a dictionary is essentially a, uh, a mapping or like a hash table if you've done Perl before, where you map a key to a value, essentially, and all the keys have to be unique. And going back to the immutableness of strings and sets, your key has to be an immutable data type. You can't use a list as a key. You can't use another dictionary as a key. You, your keys have to be immutable, which means that they can't dynamically change in your code. So that way you can make sure your keys can't change essentially. So it prevents your keys changing outside of the dictionary when you're not doing a dictionary call. That's why your keys have to be immutable. 
But your values can be anything, that any data types. You can have a dictionary of dictionaries. You can have a dictionary of lists. Your, your values can be any data type. Um, and then this is just a syntax here where you list. Uh, this isn't dimming up here every few minutes, is it? On the projector? OK. All right. It's dimming down here. It's giving the perception that it's dimming up here. So you know, you got Michigan uh, mapped to MI. You have Ohio mapped to OH, North Carolina NC. Um, and I'll, I'll get more into dictionaries here in a minute, but I was just explain like how you can import other files um, if I could get out of it. All right. Um, I, I think I'll leave it alone for now. I've already spent enough time filling with laptops today. <laughs> so, um, but back to IPython. So if I do import info, I could do import dot counties, and I could call that variable name from that file, and I can access that information. And if I had functions in there, I could do the same thing as well. But we'll we'll get into that here in a minute because I'm kind of trying to a bunch of teasers here. I'm, I I want I want to I have to talk about what a function is first before I can start saying you can call them. Uh, but, but what I was trying to go with this initially was for loops. And for loops over lists are very powerful. So in Python, very simple to do. You can do for each in info.county, since that's the variable name for the list. And you can just do print each. And it prints each item in the list, essentially. And it doesn't show the syntax, because with IPython, it shows every item in the list on a new line. If you're using the standard Python interpreter, it's going to just clump it all together and it's harder to read through. So, and you can, you can expand on this. You don't have to call, you don't have to use the word for each. You could do for x in info.counties. Um, you could do like x, and I only, let's say if I only want to show the first character of each element x, I could do print x, zero. So what this will do is it'll just, you know, loop through and it just showed the first character of each item in the list. And that's why you get a bunch of just alphabet, a list of characters. Not that useful, but yeah. Um, and speaking about usefulness, uh, going back to the tutorial, um, let me pull up the, the birthday prom real quick to see if, all right, well, I have to go over that first. So um, one of the most common, one, one of the things you usually do when you're writing Python or any, in the interpreter code is you want to ask for some input occasionally, or you just want to pass, pass command line arguments. And Python, uh, to take input from the terminal, you would use raw input. Let's say, please enter a, a number. Type. And oops, but, uh, through and, and then you would you know, type in whatever, and it would print, and, and the interpreter is just going to print back out what you type. You have to assign it to a variable to make it useful. So you would do, oops, do a equals raw input, enter a number, and I'll say 34, and then a, 34. Now the cool thing you do with this is if you drop off the raw underscore, and just use input, people can input Python code and it'll actually evaluate that Python code. Could, it can be dangerous, so don't really rely on that, but if you want to kind of make your own interpreter just for your own use to play around with, you can, you can just make an infinite while loop that just you know, keeps asking for input essentially and it will just ask for it. So if you did, uh, let's say B equals input, please enter. Or not statement, just please enter data. All right, so we enter data, we'll say two to the power of two, print B, you get four. So it actually evaluates the two to the power of two. And then that's then what's evaluated from that is stored into B. So not really safe to do if you're trying to do some secure coding, but can be useful depend on what you're really doing, if you're trying to learn a language or if you just want to make your own interpreter to play around with. Pretty nifty. Um, and you can, yeah, so you, and what goes into parentheses is what your prompt is essentially, and it doesn't add a space at the end automatically. So that's why I'm adding the space, column space at the end there. Um, 
So input and raw input are two ways to gather information from the terminal. Um, the for loops, like I said, you do for the name of your temporary variable in an item or in your list. And then your while loops, or like many other languages, you'd have to, cr you'd have to assign an integer beforehand. And I should have mentioned this as well. You don't have to, your, your variables are, de are when you declare them or you create them, you don't have to initialize them essentially. So like if you've done C++ before, you'd have to define, okay, I got this type, I got this variable name. And you have to do all that listing before you actually use the variable names. In Python, you don't, need, you don't do that. They're all dynamically generated essentially. So when I do like i equals zero, it's essentially just taking zero thrown into i. Or I could do an expression and it'll, if i doesn't exist, it will create i and then store it in there. So, uh, and this is one thing I forgot to mention. You can, di you can create a, a list of numbers very easily. So if you want to create like the numbers zero through 99, you do range, it's just range, the number you want to start at, and the number you want to end at. And the number you end at is non-inclusive, the number you, you begin with is inclusive. So it's kind of slightly different, but it, it's very useful if you want to quickly just generate a bunch of numbers and want to mess around with them. So um, where was i? So i. So if we take a variable and start off at zero, you could do while i is less than, let's say, 10. Oops, if I can spell while. All right, so you do while i is less than 10, i plus equal 1, like it. All right. And that's the other thing about Python, is to increment an, uh, an integer by 1, it's plus equals. You can also do, and this is equivalent to i equals i plus 1. In C++, you can do i plus plus, semicolon. But Python doesn't have that nice little uh, feature. But the nice thing about this is, though, you can increment by 2s, 3s, etc., or any thing as well, and you can still keep this notation. You can do i plus equals 3, and it would increment by 3 every, every iteration. So we can do like uh, print i times, we'll do i times 2. And then you get, you know, every number times 2 through here. And to relate this back to the problem I provide at the beginning of class for those who want to build something on a lap uh, with me right now, the, the birthday problem, the, the raw input is what you would probably use to let the user pick your information, like, you know, how many are in a classroom and how many times you want, to, you want to simulate it, essentially. And your mathematical operations, your multiplication is your asterisk, your division is your slash, and it does, uh, when it does enter division, integer division, it rounds down. Uh, but if you want to get a float, you have to have one of the objects be a float. And Python, when I said Python doesn't mix types, What's technically doing here, even though the one's an integer and one's a float, it's actually forcing the three to a float. So all you have to do is have one of them be a float, and it kind of knows to treat the rest of them as floats, essentially. So it's technically 3.0. And the reason you get the 8.33339 is because it's the, the precision with, yeah? So you could have 2, 5, slash 3.0, and it would still give you the eight three. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the 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 the, the long list of threes that deals with uh, precision of the processor. There's a Python library called, I believe, decimal. You can import decimal, and it will handle division and uh, multiplication, and it will it will account for this precision essentially. And the example I referred to be the birthday problem, I used that module because when you start dealing with uh, large numbers. You, the precision can start really affecting your math at some point. So it's, that's good to know. Um, and then subtraction, you know, 6 minus 3. So it's mostly like, you know, a calculator. You, if, you, if you need to do some quick math at a terminal, just open a Python and you, you, know, you can just type in your math. Um, and to the power, you know, 7 to the power 2. And there's, and this kind of deviate a little bit, there's import math. And this has a whole world of other math functions. So if you want to call cosine, you want to call like a pi, uh, or you, you can do like math.pi, oops. It will pull out a constant that has already signed for uh, pi, essentially. So that way you're not having to define that variable every time you open up your code. 
I believe there's math.e as well. Um, all, your own, all your trig functions, including their inverses, I believe, are available as well. And there's also import C math, which is your complex math, which I believe includes all your trig functions, but with um, imaginary numbers. So you can also handle that as well, and it's really powerful. So that way you're not having to treat it as a string, or you're not having to use different data types to represent the imaginary numbers. And in fact, the imaginary numbers, I believe, it treats as the A plus, is it A plus BI, I believe is the format for them. So it'll just you know, print off as that when you evaluate it. Um, deviate a little bit here, where's it? Oh yeah, the while loop. <laughs> so the, our I, well I, uh, I showed the while loop. Yeah, I already showed the while loop up there. So the while loop, the review again, if you want to create a infinite while loop, you just do while one, and you can do like print A. Oops. And it'll just infinitely print until you control C it, which. Now, oh, command C. No. Okay, there we go. Actually, I killed IPython in the process. So, uh, I don't think the, the control C was passing from Mac. I, as you can tell, I'm not really familiar with Macs. Um, I'm not ragging on them. I just, I'm not familiar with them. Um, so, back to IPython. Um, so we're doing the lists, or no, we're doing while loops. So the while one print infinite loop, you do while true as well, and for your booleans as well, I kind of hit at this. And if you've done other programs before, technically a boolean, a boolean is a uh, subset of an integer. It's inherited from an integer. It's essentially either a one or a zero. For, so your true is a one and your false is a zero. But in Python, you could just use the keyword name true, or you could just use the keyword name false. Uh, or actually, it's capital true, capital false. In C++, it's lowercase f, lowercase t. So that's quick boolean, and if you did a type, you'll get, ah. If you get type, you'll get bool, essentially. Well, you, you do get bool, so it tells you what the type is. Um, so th that's your while loop. Your while loop's pretty powerful. You, you'd have to declare some type of incrementer beforehand. And then, you, and then you increment inside the while loop and have some comparison. And speaking about comparisons, you, your comparisons are very similar to our languages if you've used our language before. If not, uh, the way it works is it's like doing a, if you've done math, bef uh, math comparisons before, like 3 less than 5, uh, 7 less than 12, or 15 greater than 8, uh, you could do 8 less than 13. And it will evaluate that statement on the interpreter and it will tell you it's true. Um, or if you did 8, it's greater than 13, it'll tell you false because that value is false. And you can also throw in your equal signs. Your equal signs have to go after the greater than or less than symbol. So it has to be the second part in that operation. So 8 greater than or equal to 13, since that's not true, it evaluates to false. Um, so your comparisons, what's nifty about your comparisons, you can also do... And this kind of ties in with if statements, which I'm bringing up, trying to bring up with this as well. Is you can do like, uh, so back to the counties thing. Info counties. Oops. So, oh. Oops. All right. So what was appears to happen is when I did the control D thing, it jumped me out of the window and Tmux to a different one, my directory changed. So we'll import info again, get info. And the thing about the comparisons is we could do if Franklin in info.counties. Oh yeah. Print yes. And it prints yes. So what's really nice about this is you can you can give it an arbor an arbitrary temporary string that's not assigned to a variable, and say in and it checks to see if it's in whatever variable you're calling. So you're checking if the county in Franklin, which is where Columbus is, is in the list of counties I have available. And you can also do this for dictionaries as well, which is 
very useful. So that way you're not having to loop through the entire data set to find out if your object is in there somewhere. So you do if Franklin and if OKIs and print yes. So you can do, you can also do if Franklin not in. So you can do Franklin not in the counties. And we won't get any output with this because Franklin is in info.counties, so that if statement evaluates to false and therefore doesn't do the if, if or the print yes. Um, so it's your basic uh, if statement, an if else statement, you would just do your, you'd have uh, if Franklin in. And then your else would just be else colon, and then you run it like that. So your else would just be your catch all, essentially, if, if you've ever done if statements before. So if that doesn't evaluate the true, just run whatever's in the else part. And you can also do if else as well, or not if else, else if. And that way you can specify different cases as well. So you could do uh, if Franklin, if it dot counties, print yes, uh, else if. Uh, Cuyahoga and info.counties uh, and then you can you can basically break down like essentially like a case statement like you would see like in C++ essentially and go through that um, so that's your basic if statement basic uh, kind of touch on comparisons the end is pretty powerful like I said so it's easy to see what's inside other variables or do comparisons to see if something is in the variable so that your if, your if statements in Python, and this is what I was going back to, it's very English readable, is like instead of, it uses a word in which makes it a little easier for someone who's either new to Python or is coming up to your code, can look and understand, well, so it looks like they're trying to take this object and see if it's in this other object. And you don't have to use the word is because it's, it's implied there as well. So it's just if blank in blank execute the next line or the next block of line, and that's, and that's uh, one thing I kind of forgot to mention. It's really very important. Is the white space is how you define your scopes in Python. So you can have multiple lines for the if inside the if spot. So if we well, actually it'd be easier. Did Franklin and info count as we could do print yes. I could do print like seven times two. All right. So whatever is indented below the if statement is all part of that scope and can be used in that scope. Same thing for the else statement as well. So all your your and if you're not familiar with what a scope is, a scope is essentially all block is like the is a Think of it like directories. Um, if you're on Windows or Linux, the f what's it's what's available across the directories if you recursively go in. So if you're the further indented you are, what's available there? So what you declare there stays there, and what you declare further up in the tree or further up is accessible deeper in. Essentially, a fuller idea is probably not a good analogy. <laughs> Um, so you, 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 you can, you know, uh, nest if statements as well. So if we, you can do if Franklin and info.counties, and then the next I could do if, uh, if seven is an integer. You, you, can, you can just keep nesting those, and you just keep indenting. So like your next, your, your third line would be more indentation. And it, it's kind of hard to do long multi-line statements in an interpreter, whether you're using IPython or whether you're using Python uh, interpreter on a command line. So I'm, I'll, I'll pull up the, the birthday problem and go through that and show, uh, uh, show the multiple indentations for that, because it's, it's a lot simpler to do that. And I'll, that'll, that will give me an opportunity to show you the, the part about dictionaries as well for listing those. Um, speaking about dictionaries, yes, dictionaries. So dictionary is like I was saying before, it's like your hash map it, or, or your hash table. It's a mapping. You're, you're, you're taking, you're, you're, you're mapping 
elements to other elements, essentially. And we had the if info.states is a dictionary create where we map the state names to the two digit codes. So we, you know, Texas to TX, Ohio to OH. And the, the syntax for this is you, you put your first, ver your first key or your keys, colons, and then your value, and then comma, and you can have multiple entries within your dictionary. Which is, like I said, if you've used Perl before, it's like a hash table. If you haven't used anything before, think of a, a hash table or a mapping like, like a phone book, essentially. You open up a phone book, you look up someone's name, and it's mapped to a specific phone number. So, and all the, all the, actually it'd be inverse, it'd be like, it'd be a reverse phone book lookup. You can look up, you'd have, your keys would be your phone numbers because they all have to be unique. And then the names could be your values because multiple people can have the same names and have different phone numbers. So if you ever open a phone book, you, you'll see like there's like 100 John Smiths within like, you know, a large city like Columbus, or at least, I don't know if there's 100, but there's, you'll see repeats of names. So it would actually be a better analogy to think of your keys as a phone number and then your values as, uh, as the name. And you can also do, um, like I was saying earlier, you can have different data types as your values. You can throw in a list as well. So you can have, uh, uh, we'll say, who equals dictionary, and then we can say uh, Mike's map to a list of, we'll say, uh, birth year, birth month, and birth day. So you could do that, foo, and then you just have uh, a list as well. So Mike, the string Mike is mapped to that list, essentially. So if I want to reference Mike, I can just do Mike, and it pulls out the value for that. And this is the accessor for a dictionary as well, it's just square brackets, and then the, the the variable or the, that's inside your dictionary. So if we did info.states, we can do Virginia and we get VA. Now, let's say for our dictionary up there where we had the, the, the list of states, let's say if we want to do a reverse lookup, we want to take the two digit code TX and we want to get Texas from it instead of going Texas to TX. You, you can still do that, but that would, that would require you to do uh, a loop for it because you can't, or in this example, we're, we're sure that there's 50 unique states, there's no duplicates. I could populate this table, or not table, uh, dictionary, so that we have multiple, va we have different states with the same value, essentially. So I could make an erroneous entry and say Washington, it's actually WV. It's not true, but that's still valid because dictionary, because as long as the keys are unique, the values can be whatever. So you can't guarantee that you can do a reverse mapping, essentially, because there's, there could be multiple keys with the same value. So it's not very, if you need to do that kind of reverse lookup, you'd probably want to store it in a different data set. Most likely a, a data, a, like a true database at that point, depend on how you want to parse the information. Um, and speaking about databases real quickly, Python comes with SQLite 3 for people who are real into SQL. So you don't have to install like MySQL and configure or run in a server or anything like that. It's, and SQLite 3 is just a, it's technically a flat file and you don't really need to set up username and passwords. It just throws into a .db file and it's a lot more portable than like trying to move a MySQL database file because you don't have to shut down services or anything like that. But it comes with Python and it's very usable. If you need to just quickly store stuff in a database, if you need more efficient database usage, you'd probably want to use MySQL or Postgres uh, or whatever other database types are out there. I, believe, I don't know if there's an MS SQL available for Python, but it wouldn't surprise me if there is. Uh, I spoke too long there. Uh, okay, good. All right. I'm starting to work Max a lot more. <laughs> okay, so to the dictionaries, we could do reverse lookups, uh, but we'd have to loop over, essentially. So we could do, and looping over dictionaries is kind of unique 
but I should back up here. So we can do info.states, and if, like I was saying earlier, you could do a dir, and what dir does is it shows you all the methods off of your object. So if you don't know what's available for a dictionary, you can, you can find out yourself, so you can use info.states, and it shows you what's available. So now you can see you can do dot .clear, dot .copy, and if you're still not sure what these are, there's also uh, the Python documentation on their website's very useful, or you can also use uh, help. And if you, do, uh, if you throw the data type, you can actually pull up the help documentation for uh, that data type as well. And what this is showing is it's showing the, the class that defined that object. And if you, it's a lot more technical, but if you don't feel like opening up in a browser to read documentation about Python, it's a very quick way to get uh, down into like the code and see what's actually going on. It might be a little bit more intimidating for those who've never programmed before, or have no idea what any of this really means. Um, but this is just think of this as like documentation and some pseudo code, um, because like there's. It's, this, this is actually a generated documentation, so it's not actual code that's used to create that class, because like, a lot of these lines here are just comments, and you would technically, to do a common Python, you'd have to prepend the line with a uh, uh, pound sign. Yes? So Dir gives you the method? It will give you a list of all methods available on an object. Is it at one uh, What do you mean? Oh, for, oh, okay, uh, for classes, I've, you can recreate the types. I don't know if that's the correct terminology I'm looking for. Um, but let's say, for example, you wanted to add functionality to an integer to, let's say, do dot, um, dot divide by zero. So you can handle div division by zero cases. You can, you can inherit from that and create a new class and then create that new class named as integer in your code. So that way you can call int, uh, or when you create an integer, all new integers are created can still have those properties, essentially. Um, so I can't really whip an example of that right now, um, but if you wanna talk afterwards, uh, we can go over more about how to do it. But that's, uh, since I'm trying to focus more on a little bit more beginner stuff, and that, that, that's a great that's a great concept, but it's a lot. It's it's pretty. I want to say pretty, but it's kind of comp, It's kind of complex. But gr great question, though. Great question. Um, but about the help documentation, you want to get quick help. Don't want to open a browser. Just use help and then the name of the object or the data type as well. Uh, in the interpreter, and this works. In, like I said, if you're using a Python interpreter or I Python as well. Um, so. Back to the dictionary list, we had info.states, but if we want to get the list of the keys, you can do dot keys, and this will pull off the keys listed in that dictionary. And you can also uh, do dot values, and this will list the values as well. But it, so that way you can rip up the, 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 the dictionary, essentially. And what, what's good about this is you, it makes it, uh, well, I shouldn't say good, but this, this is a way to identify what's available off of the dictionary. Because when you do a loop, or for a dictionary, 4K in info.states, print K, the, the, when, you, when you put that temporary variable there, it's only looping over the keys. It's not looping over the key value pair. So if I wanted to print off, oops, 4X in info.states, if I want to print off the associated ones, I do print X, then info.states X. So what I'm doing is here is, for each uh, key in that uh, dictionary, I'm printing that key, and also on the same line, I'm printing what that value is. And because I'm using the uh, accessor call info.states, because with a dictionary, the accessor call is square brackets like a list. So we run this code, and we get the match up there. So, but if but trying to do the reverse matchup, you'd have to do four key in info.states. Uh, if, let's say, AK, and then for your equivalent, it's double equals, and for that states, X, print, we've, oops.
All right. So what this did here is we looked through all the keys in info dot states, and when we came to uh, a value, uh, because info dot states, we access the value for the current key. When it eventually matched AK, we said we found Alaska. Yes. When in the previous one did they not come in the same order as what they were presented? Uh, that's a good question. So in Python two X or any version of Python two, dictionaries are non-sorted. So your keys are never stored in memory as sorted. So if you want to, for example, one of the common things to do with a dictionary is you want to get a list of sorted keys. And what you, what you do with that is you use the dot keys method and uh, off that dictionary and you, you throw that into a list and then you run sort on that. And, you can, uh, and with lists you can sort them very easily. So to do that we'd say uh, keys, well to prevent a uh, uh, variable clip, we'll do kys equals info.states.keys, and, and the print k will, will show it's out of order, but you can do sort, and then and it sorts in place, so now all your states are sorted. And now to generate the diction, to, to access those in order is you would just do 4x in uh, kys, and then you'd access the appropriate value with that, essentially. So it's, in Python 2x, it's not very easy, to handle sorted dictionaries, but and supposedly in Python 3 they actually have sorted dictionaries. And uh, speaking about the versions real quickly, most of your uh, distributions are going to be run Python 2x unless you're using Arch Linux. Um, and what I mean by distribution, I mean you're running Linux. If you're running Windows, you can download Python from their website. As far as a two versus three paradigm, well, I could spend like two hours going on about which one's better, which one's worse. But the quick gist is, most of your legacy code's still in 2x, and a lot of your newer projects are still done in the 2x branch. There's still a shift to try to bring people up to 3, the three, the 3x stuff. Like I think that they're on like 3.4 now, or 3.3, three, three, um, or 3.2. I, I, I really don't use 3x because the two versions are not backwards compatible, so you, you can't really like take your Python 2 code and then just straight run in a Python 3 interpreter and vice versa. There are scripts out there that will convert your code for you, but those aren't 100% accurate as with, you know, your scripts that would convert your code from, let's say, Perl 5 to Perl 6 or from different versions in different languages because, and I, I don't, I'd almost venture to say once you want a history of almost any language, there comes a time when they update the language to a point where they just kind of break it. So stuff is no longer backwards compatible. I'm not saying every language is like that, but it seems that's the general pattern for most power languages. There comes a version where some of your stuff just stops working and when you try to run with a newer version of a compiler or version of Python, you'll find out that my stuff's not working and it'll, you'll see a bunch of new errors and stuff and you're like, I don't understand this and it's just, a lot of times, just make sure you run the version number that your code is intended to run for. And you can also put in version checks in your software as well. Um, so as dictionaries, quick spiel about Python 2.3, um, functions. To do a function, you just your your keyword you want is def, and then your function name, and then, oops, it's kind of hard to see. The variables you want to pass in, if you don't want to pass in anything, uh, you just leave the your curly brackets closed, and then you put what you want to do inside. And pass is a keyword that just says do nothing, and it essentially just passes, it does nothing. So now my func is still the function I can call. Because it's, it's a function that exists, it's just not doing anything because I didn't tell it to do anything. I just said, sit there, essentially. And that's, that's what the word pass is doing. It's just, it's just sitting there. Um, so that's a quick way to create a function. You can return uh, values with functions as well using the return statement. So you can do def my function, or we'll say multiply. I'll say return, oops, probably pass a variable in there. So we'll say import, or we're passing in two variables, x and y, and we'll return x times y. There, if I can spell. All right, so now if I run multiply and I pass in three and five, I'm getting out the multiplication of that, and that's what the return statement does. So it evaluates what statement I put in the return line, and then it shoves it back when I call it. So and you can also store that into an R variable. So I could do B equals that, and it will give me 15. So that's, that's your very basic 
function. You can also nest functions within functions as well if you want to get really complicated. Um, and like I say, you just got to make sure your indents are all handled well. And a quick thing about the indents, um, they're, depending on who you ask, depends on how you should indent. In your interpreter, it's usually when you hit tab, it's usually an actual tab character. The PEP8, which is uh, a standard that, or well, the standard written that's like, it's more like a suggestion for most Python code says that you're t you shouldn't be using tab characters, it should be four spaces for every tab stop. Um, so if, if you ever come across something that says my code's PEP8 compliant, that means there's a list of checks on how they write their code that it's valid by. For example, like the three comma five, that space has to be there to be PEP8 compliant. If you don't put the space there, it's still valid Python code, it's just not PEP8 compliant. PEP8 uh, PEP standard is very long. Uh, very good read if you want to write your code in a very consistent manner and you want to stick to something like that. Very interesting though, there's also uh, editor plugins that will value your code for you. For example, I use VI and I use a plugin called PEP8 or PyPEP8. That essentially I just press a five and it does all checks for me, tells what lines are bad and what, and then I just go ahead and fix them and then run it again and it shows my code's valid. And I'll show you that on the birthday prom I was talking about. Um, and then uh, I already talked about our, our libs. We had, you know, math and CMath. A few other powerful libraries that are very useful, especially if you want to do uh, anything like any type of scripting is uh, if you want to pull in stuff from the web, there's URLib2. And there's also random. And this would be useful for if you're, doing the, if you're trying to do the Berkeley problem as well. So you do the random dot, let's say rand int. And I want to generate a random integer between 0 and 100. I get out 12. You can also do uh, random dot random, and it'll generate a random number from 0 to 1. And you can also do random dot seed. And what that does is it seeds it changes the seed of random to the current Unix time on your system if you're on Mac, Linux. Um, now at the end here, I'll have a quick talk about Windows, um, about using Python Windows. It's, I'll say that for the end there. Um, so uh, random generates random numbers. You can also pick random items from a list. So, and this, this is really useful if you're trying to like randomize some data. So we had, was it? Uh, let's say random.choice, then we'll do info.states. Um, oh, we want counties. We want a list. Yeah, you can't, you have to give it a list, not a dictionary. And that's why I got that error, because I tried passing it the, the info.states, which is a dictionary from the state name to the two digit code. So info.counties, you'd run this again, you'd just get a different county, and it just, you know, so if you want to get a random line from a list, quick way to do it. Um, URL lib, if you want to pull in source code from a website, you can also do, let's say, uh, source equals URL2, URL open. And three things here. URL lib2 is the name of the library, and you're calling the method URL open off that library. And you put in your link, and then the dot read essentially takes the source code and puts it into a giant string and we're calling that string source. So it's just gonna be one massive string. So if we do this and then print source, you're getting just one huge string. Probably not the most efficient way to see the code, but if you wanna, let's say, parse order through it, um, you can do, let's say, source.split, and we'll split on new lines only. So we're not splitting spaces if we didn't provide a parameter. Now we create a list where each item in the list is now each line in the code. So if you pull up Google's code or Google's website and then did control you in your browser, you would and uh, you would get each each item that list is every new line. And then there's 27 lines on your source code line, just pulled it in essentially. And that's what LEN does. It, it shows you it's a global function that shows you a length of pretty much any data type you throw at it that has uh, a method call on the class that allows for it. So if you want, if we want to do like, you know, length of hello, it's a five. You can also do that on a dictionary as well. 
and it would return the number of keys in the dictionary. So we do info dot states, and we get 50. So we know we have 50 states. That's a quick way to verify how much you have of something there. Um, so that's uh, th those are a few simple things from standard library. There's also import OS and import sys, uh, which brings in your different modules that are depend on your operating system. So uh, your dot OS, for example, would provide out information about the current operating system you're on, you run Python. So if you run on Linux or Mac, the, 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 fun, the operating system calls the, the underlying C code Python's written in, those will change, but the OS calls should remain constant. So that, that kind of allows you to write a lot more smoother code that's uh, cross-platform compatible. And uh, Python is cross-platform, so what you write on Linux should work on Mac and Windows, just like how Java is supposed to work on every architecture. Um, or, well, without, uh, without having to recompile, essentially, for, uh, I believe. Um, I forget the analogy with Java. I clearly don't use Java that much. I'm more of a C++ guy when I'm not using Python. Um, so I'm kind of biased. That's why all my examples are leaning towards C++ there. So if you're a Java person, please forgive me. <laughs> um, so your OS functions, you can pull in, you know, like as you can see from this list here, the bottom half of the list, you can do uh, your random. Actually, that's a function call. There. Well, you'd have to pass it. So if you want to see what it does, uh, let's it's os.u random, and you pull it up, and it says you provide a string, return a string of random. Of any random bytes suitable for crypto cryptographic use. Um, if I remember how to. Not sure why that work. It doesn't work. Um, but your OS allows you to operate your allows you to access your operating functions, and your Sys allows you to or, or to access your system accessible things that. For example, let's say if you want to pass command line arguments. You can do sys, uh, sys.argv, and that will provide a list of your command line arguments. It won't work in here because I'm inside the interpreter, uh, because it's only going to show you what I ran, and I only ran the interpreter. So that's why it's only showing the first command line. If I, had a, if I was writing this inside a file, it would show me what I passed on that line. Um, if you're doing command line arguments, you would not want to build a script that would parse that because there's a bunch of libraries already do that for you. For example, there's op parse, there's arg, arg parse, and uh, lots of ways to do it. I believe arg parse is the, the way to do it now. But I believe it requires Python 2.7 branch. But if you want to make it code backwards compatible, I believe you want to use opt parse, OPT parse. And that goes back to 2.4, and then there's even something before that. So there's been lots of revisions to the, which library is recommended to be used for parsing command line arguments. Because trust me, if you, if you had to write a function to do it every single time, you'd grow, you'd grow insane pretty quickly, unless you really enjoyed that. So uh, quick thing up to the, 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 the birthday problem I was talking about. Um, as you can see up here, we import math, random, sys. And that's similar as we were, as I mentioned earlier, um, doing some print statements, and we're pulling in some information from standard input using raw input, and the int function here is forcing that input to become an integer. So whatever someone enters, it forces into an integer. So when you type in zero, it's a string by default according to raw input, but we're forced into a type of integer. So if you type in, let's say, foo, it's, it's going to error out because you can't convert foo to a number. Um, to clear a few variables here, match is equal to zero and unmatch is equal to zero. And we have a function here where we uh, have a function name called find matches, pass in numbers. And like I said before, this code is essentially simulating the birthday problem where we're generating uh, a room of people with random birthdays. And we're generating, let's say, we're generating like 10 different rooms with with the same number of people in each room, but every room has different birthdays for each people. And then we're analyzing if two, if we could find at least, you know, how many people in that room share their birthday, essentially. Um, so what the function find match is doing is it's it's looping over. It, 
it, it's, it's looping over trying to find out if we have matching birthdays from the list numbers. Because numbers comes in as a list, and we're, doing, we're saying for four number in numbers, and if numbers dot count for each number is greater than one, we're going to add that number to S. And S is a set we're creating where it's, it, we're, we're creating a set of the numbers that are matched, essentially. And then A and S is true, so that, that's the Boolean we create to say, hey, look, we found some matches. And then the trials is a, is a while loop I put down here, so, because originally when I wrote this, I just did for, you know, one classroom with 40 people, but I was like, well, that doesn't really show that this, the birthday problem's consistent. So, we, ah, the comments show uniquely. So, the comments start with these pound signs, and apparently in this terminal they show up as bold, I don't know how we can see that, but um, they kind of stick out. Depending on your editor, they'll show up differently. So we go through well, through trials, and also you can do minus equal. I don't think I really mentioned that, but you can decrement as well. Minus equal one. We seed the random. Uh, we we reseeded the seed for random. You don't have to do this, but it's it creates more randomness essentially. And then the line here does, and I briefly mentioned it. Um, and there's like a lot of things in here at once. But this is called list comprehension. And what that means is you can create lists from lists about lists. Now that's a loaded sentence. But if, if you're new to Python, it's very, 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 very powerful, I would say. Because it allows you to, let's say, take the, let's import our info again. So let's say we want to create a list of those counties. But let's say we want to change the capitalization on those counties in that list. So we can do uh, x dot lower for x in info dot counties. Now what this is going to do, it creates a new list. That create a new list where I applied the function dot or the method dot lower off of the string x for each x in info counties. So the so info dot counties is a list of those counties. And we're doing our for loop from earlier where we're saying for each item in info counties. And then what's preceded by the for is what operation you want to do in that for loop. So it's a quick way to put a for loop on one line. But you have to do it inside the, the square brackets because you're generating a new list here. And it only works, this one line syntax only works as list comprehension. So essentially we create a new list from an existing list of lists. Or not of lists, but very powerful. You do a lot more complicated stuff. It's pretty useful. Um, go back to our birthday problem here. Say then uh, B day. All right. So we we have our trials down here. Now down here where it's a little bit more mathematical. Um, I'm not really going to go into the math too much. But the idea is with the birthday problem is they tell you they have a formula to determine what the statistic is for having two people match on two birthdays in a, in a room of X number of people. If you do a Wikipedia search, it'll show you the formula in a more pleasant way than code. Because um, I'm not really focusing too much on how the math works. It's, it's statistics. Uh, I like observing statistics, but I'm not good at statistics. So it, it, it's, 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 it's really interesting. And one of the things that inspired me to write this script was I had a, a coworker of mine at the time who argued with me that the formula was BS. And I, at the time, I was sure if they were just, you know, mess with me or if they were serious, but they kept providing arguments against that, you know, statistics can actually show that with a room of 23 people, there's a 50-50 chance that you, you can have two people match on a birthday. So I, create the script, I was like, well, you know, if we generate some random data and play with it, let's see what actually happens. And uh, never actually got a chance to show them it, but I thought I thought it was pretty interesting, because it, 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 that way you're not just relying on that statistics. Um, all right, so we'll run this throughout. We'll, we'll, oh, and the, the round is a global function that essentially rounds uh, a given number to a certain amount of decimals. So what we're doing is we're taking uh, the number PE, which is a float. And a float, like I said earlier, is 
like you know, 25.0 or 25.7 or 3.14, and round to the fourth decimal. And it provides your standard rounding rules if it's 0 0.50 or above, you round up 0.49 below, you go down. So we'll, let's run this code. And uh, I'll put this, this code's already available on my GitHub, actually. So if you want to actually pull up the code and mess with it, you can. Uh, the URL for that is github.com slash piano. And uh, I believe it's birthday problem. I don't know, just if you pull my profile slash m piano on GitHub, you'll see it listed up there. Um, so if you're on a laptop, you can pull that up um, as well. So we'll, let's run the B-Day code. And it's going to ask us, so, you know, it says, this will send me the birthday problem by generating XX random numbers between 1 to th and 365 inclusively. So what we're doing is representing each birthday. Instead of doing the whole month, day, year thing, we're actually just, you know, generating a bunch of random numbers from 1 to 365. And if two of those match, we're saying that those are a birthday. Because we're just, we're providing, because there's only 365 days in a year, most years. And... By generating RAM numbers through that, we could treat each number as a different birthday, because essentially each birthday and year can be represented as uh, different numbers between 1 and 365. So the number of people, RAM people we want to generate, let's say well, we have what, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. We have 18 people in here. So we'll generate this, and uh, we'll, say we'll simulate, let's say, 25 rooms. The smaller number of rooms you have, the it, this also calculates a percent of error. I threw in there as well. So, it, uh, we'll s so we did a number of successful trials, seven, and the percent of successful trials was 28. So that means 28 out of, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's 20% of the trials were successful. And it was expecting a 34% uh, rate of success. So that means out of, s out of the 18 rooms, seven of them had two, at least two people with matching birthdays. And which is 28%. And, but according to the formula, it should have been 34% of the total number of people out of those rooms. And then down below, it just it tells you what your percent errors were kind of off. But the more number of rooms you simulate, the higher the, the closer it gets to. So now your percent error is negative 6. So it's a lot closer than percent of error of 24. And then the more people you have, the, the the more stable it becomes. So let's say if we did uh, uh, 23 people and we did 100 trials, your expected percent of successful trials is about 50%. We actually, in this time we ran it, we got 57. And if we keep running this, the number of successful trials number will always change. And then your number of, uh, but this number will stay constant because it's just a solid formula. Um, and then percent error will change as well. But as far as like what Python's doing behind the scene here, there's a lot. There's the, it's mostly math operations that are calculating this out at the bottom. Oops. So down here, we're actually run through the formulas, and I had to do the result not equals zero to prevent a division by zero error. Which technically, if you do this simulation with one room, it comes up with a division by zero. I think I have to double check my math, but. Uh, more about the Python, though, is you can, uh, you can combine mathematical operations on one line. That's a big thing to take away from this bottom part. Um, and you can also, as far as the math function, you can use, there's also math.factorials. So it's, fact, it's, factor, it's making a factorial of 365 exclamation point, because that's part of the formula. And 365 to the power of people plus math.factorial of 365 minus people times 100. Um, so yeah, it's math. I'm not really going to too much explain about how the formula came out to be, but uh, definitely really interesting if you're into statistics. It shows you how it works with Python. If you want to, what's really nifty about this is if you want to make an argument about speed comparisons, you can also uh, on Unix you can do time, b day, and then or oh. So, quick thing to point out, you know, when you try to run your files, make sure you're executable, even if you already have the shebang line in there. That's why the network, so if we do, or, we'd, and we'd also need to do that too. Uh, and then you could, you know, store these number in here, but because I'm running time and entering numbers myself, it's not going to be consistent. Um, 
but you can hard code those in there and keep making mathematical changes to see if you could get speed optimizations. Um, oh, I keep doing that again. All right, um, any questions so far? Anything about Python at all? Um, I've covered most of everything. I'm gonna go into uh, how, to how to access more help, how to access fancy stuff, really. Um, for example, like I was talking about the Pi Google Voice thing, that's, you know, if you do a Google search for Python and then what you're trying to accomplish, there's most likely an API out there that already exists, or you can build one yourself. Um, as far as the standard library goes, there's, if you're, let's say if you're making a, uh, a, URL, a URL call to Twitter, for example, and you're sending post data, like you want to, you can essentially tweet from Python like you can using curl on Linux. So you can essentially, Send a post, or send send your information, or even just search for information by passing a URL parameter to Twitter. Because if you ever look at Twitter's API, you provide what's an API code, the method you want to call, and you can pull up a list of a person's followers, for instance. And uh, with that, you can take the source code of that, and if they return, if their API returns, let's say a JSON object, there's libraries in uh, there's libraries available that will help you parse JSON, so you don't have to build your own parser for that. There's also libraries for parsing uh, uh, XML as well, so that way you don't have to mainly use regexes. And speaking of regexes, uh, it's kind of a little bit more advanced I want to go into, but you can do regex in Python, but it's not as nice as Perl, I'd have to say. That's one thing, well that's pretty much, in my opinion, the biggest strong point for Perl is its regular expressions, because uh, really Perl's only, in my opinion, good for massive amounts of text processing. Um, but with Python, uh, regular expressions are a bit, you have to, it's an RE module, and you have to create an RE object, and you compile your regular expression here. So if I want to match on, let's say, A through Z plus, uh, I'm not really gonna go into what regular expressions is, or the syntax word expressions, because that's a whole nother language to learn. Um, but this is quickly, uh, you create an object, and then to search something else, you do, uh, let's say, hello world. So what this did is, it's, I created a regular expressions object that searched on any lowercase letter from A to Z, zero or one or more times. I think it's one or more times with the plus. I forget regular special for the plus and the star. Um, and then the find all, you pass it a string, and then it returns every time I found that occurrence, essentially. So every time I found a lowercase letter, A through Z, and a plus sign, we got, we got an output of list. So it's, your output's always a list, and you can parse over that. Um, quick introduction to it. I don't really want to spend too much time on this, because regular expressions, like I said, you, you could spend like a whole day on that, trying to learn regular expressions, but they are powerful. But the thing I was going with this was, as far as LXML, or L XML and JSON, there's simple JSON. Um, I don't know if I have it installed here. It's not in the standard library, but it's available through PIP. And, if, and PIP is probably your best friend ever if you're gonna use Python. So on Debian, it's, I sudo app install python-pip. And what pip does is it allows you to install stuff that's available to Python that's not in the standard library. So if we want to install simple JSON, we do sudo pip install simple JSON. And oh, which box is this? Okay. And what this does is it goes to the, the pip server, downloads the file for simple JSON, and installs it. Um, and it says it's installed successfully. So now if I try doing uh, Im uh, import simple JSON, it now works. I just installed that library. But the only disadvantage of pip is it has to be on the pi uh, where pip's looking for it at. It has to be on the servers they're looking to ping. And I believe they run a central server? I, I haven't really looked into how pip works, but they, have, they host these files. So not everything that you can import into Python is available through pip. So like that Pi Google Voice, might not be available in PIP. Um, I would have to, well, we could search for it, but um, where I want to go with this is 
You can also, there's also LXML, um, Beautiful Soup, and Feed Parser. Those are your three options for parsing XML. Uh, I, I started on LXML. Well, actually, I originally started on regular expressions, trying to parse XML and regular expressions. Big warning for everyone, if you're going to parse XML do, or JSON, do not use regular expressions because you'll get a headache. And, every, and if you try to ask for help, everyone's just going to say, if you're doing it wrong, go use a proper library for this. Because you, the problem with using regular expressions to parse uh, XML is that you can't r rely on that because your XML might not return object states or, or all fields every single time. And your, your libraries can account for that and not throw crazy errors. Whereas if you're doing this with regular expressions, it would freak out. Um, but beautiful soup was one thing I used next. And it's more object orientated, so everything is like a method call. So when you import something to beautiful soup, all your fields are now dot methods off of that object. So if you really like object orientedness, beautiful soup might be for you. My new one I've been using is feed parser. It's a lot more styled for RSS readers. Like if you want to build your own RSS reader, which I've done a couple times, um, feed parser handles that handles that a little bit nicer, in my opinion. Um, some quick sample code about that. Um, let's see if we can, yeah. Oh. So, quick backstory of this. I run an IRC bot called Jenny on Freenode, and uh, I have a module called, uh, well, it's NWS up high. And this is the National Weather Service Alert module I built. And this is where I got that states database from. And what this does is it goes to NOAA's, it goes to weather.gov, and like every 10 seconds it pulls down their massive XML file of all weather watches, warnings, alerts, and advisories across the entire country. And I parse through it and spit it out into different channels depending on which state you're in. So the quick way to show how few parsers work in here, and I'm also using some database stuff, which I'll show as well, is, uh, where's that? So, uh, all right, so here's where I'm doing the parsing. So I have parse equals feed parser dot parse and then warning dot uh, underscore list. And warning underscore list is the source of the URL I pulled in. And I send it to feed parser. And, it, and with the dot parse method, it goes through and figure and, uh, and looks at all the fields in there and then generates a data structure for that. And then from parsed, I can now access the entries field, and I can actually count how many of those I see. And if I have more than zero, I continue. Um, and then, or if I don't have more than zero, I continue, because that means I didn't find any new, or I didn't find anything at all. And then for entity and parse, that means for every time I see, or that's not entity, that's entries. Every time I see entries in parsed, I want to do this resulting code down here. And this is this all run in an infinite loop, or an event loop, I should say. And it's handling that. And then there's a function called the top here that handles, or, well, yeah, so parse, parsing, yeah, OK. So entry equals entity. So now the entry dictionary, where I'm making all these, like, uh, all these calls where I'm doing entry cap certainty and I'm assigning those to appropriate names. So essentially an entry is now a dictionary of the entire XM, or XML file pulled down. Um, beautiful soup, the difference when it does this for XML is you just do like entry dot summary and you'd have that object. So if you like the object orientedness of that better, that might be more for you. I like this a little bit better for what I was doing because there's only, there's I think like 30 different types available in there, and I didn't really need all those. I just needed, you know, the important ones, I thought, for this data. Um, so, I mean, you can make an argument of whether that's better or not, but in my opinion, I, I, uh, the, example I, the example code I found to do this on someone's blog uh, was using feed parser, and I kind of just rolled with it ever since then, and now for everything I do with RSS or XML files, I just use feed parser, because I guess it's, it's just what I've started using recently. Uh, 
Quick thing here, SQLA 3, if you want to create a database, you just do connect. Not really, I didn't really want to get into this talk, but it, it's kind of, that's how simple it is to create a, a call to a database file, and then you, you do your fancy, uh, fancy SQL statements if you know what SQL is. Um, if not, don't worry about it, because that's, that's, that's pretty advanced, more than what I really wanted to do with this talk. Um, so, and then, uh, where is it? So this, that, that's, that's how you handle uh, XML. And, uh, you want to use a, a library for that, because it, it, it can be very, very overwhelming, especially since some XML files are rather large. I believe that's most of everything, and I'm thinking I'm coming up on time too. Does anyone have any questions? Curious about anything? Something I didn't cover that they wanted to see in Python? Um, I, 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 the talk was supposed to be more intermediate stuff like Python 102. Um, I was kind of pressed for time because I was originally told prepare to talk for two hours, at least two hours, but at most four hours, and then because I, I didn't really didn't know how long this was supposed to last, and then it. And with all the technical difficulties, that actually ended up being more like an hour and a half. Yes? What space class did classes are derived from? I believe it's called, object. yeah, just object. I believe, I, and don't quote this, I'm not a Ruby person. I believe it's the same in Ruby as well. Yeah. So what he's pointing out at, for those who are not familiar with object orientatedness, is that everything inheritance, every object inherits from another object, essentially. And so what happens is there has to be a, a master parent, essentially, somewhere in the hierarchy uh, or in, or in the, the tree. And the master parent is where everyone's derived from. So think of it like, you know, it's like Adam and Eve of all objects within uh, your code, essentially. So everything's uh, inherited from that. Um, I'm, I kind of wanted to go into, like, how you create your own objects, but that was a little further past time I really have available because I think it's supposed to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Um, uh, oh, and the execute code that you have created in a file, um, like I showed earlier, you just run Python and that. This runs an error because I'm calling a thing that's outside directory. Um, this is, oh, that's an error nifty thing. Um, so you can actually import directories in Python, which is kind of nifty. So let's say, for example, I want to import that modules folder I was just in. I can do that. And the reason I could do that is because inside that, oops, if I can get back there. So inside that modules folder, we have what's called a inet file that's blank. And if you put a blank double underscore inet double underscore dot pi file, it basically, it's told in Python, allow this directory to be imported. And then from there, you can actually call this file. So in Python, so if we, we could do from, or actually I'm already in modules, so we'll back up a directory. So we could do IPython from modules, oops, from modules, import National Weather Service. And now I could call that file that's in that folder because I have the double inet file there. Because now, because by putting that file there, Python's like, Python knows now treat it as an object, essentially. Um, you could use the import OS to actually pull out the source code of the file and try parsing it, but that's a lot more complicated, and this is a lot more easier. Um, and then from .nws, you can do uh, the functions I have in there, like alerts. It won't, and it shows you that that's a variable I have of a string of where I'm pulling this information on player.gov, for example. And then uh, string formatting. Yeah. Didn't really go into that, um, but it's really powerful, and it's different. If you get a chance, this is, this you can do a dot format on a string, but that's only available on two seven. And I warn you right now because the two seven branch is trying to pull in stuff from three and the two without making people go to three quite yet. So a lot of features that are available in the two seven branch. Python will not work in Python two six and below, like the string dot format part will not work in uh, uh, Python 2.6 and below, or, or is it Python 2.5? I think it's Python 2.5 and below. They imported it to 2.6 and up. Um, also, you can technically do dictionary sorting in Python 2.7.2, I think. 
Um, but that I don't don't quote me on that. Um, there's a there's other uh, little things in the two seven branch that they're really tried to bring over Python three. Some some of it's worked, some of it has entirely worked. Um, but it's very powerful, and I believe one the dot format was one thing they brought over. And what that is is that uh, when you normally do a string, uh, say you do. So what this does is, oops. Uh, oh, I forgot to close my string. All right. So what that does is it fills in in order this percent s's. But if you have, if you're calling, let's say, like one string in several different spots in another string, you could use the the placeholders and as whatever orders you want with inside a string. Um, and then when you do the dot format, your first one goes to zero. And then your second one goes to the, the one. So you can do Mike Foo Mike. And you only had to type Mike and Foo once each. So the dot format's a lot nicer in the sense that you don't have to keep repeating the data. But if I tried doing it with the percent s, I'd have to type Mike a second time. Because it's essentially saying you gotta be very explicit in that. But the dot format, a lot more general. And, well, it's a lot more nicer on the eyes and it's a lot more easier when typing the code out. And I think um, is there anything coming up at 12.30? Anyone? No? no? I'll have my thing handy. Uh, it's lunchtime. Um, I can keep talking if people are still interested. Um, you want me to keep going? I mean, it doesn't really... I'll, I'll keep talking if people are willing to listen, really. Um, but before everyone heads out, there's no questions at all? Or no questions? All right. The Jenny, yeah. I actually, uh, the, the fork that's, so I, I recently forked Jenny and I made WX bought this run on Freenode. So if you go to like pound pound weather dash US dash Ohio, you'll see me, Chanserv, and WX bot. But WX bot is run a more optimized version of the code because one thing I found that was nifty, and this might become useful to you guys, but there's a library called text wrap. And what text wrap allows you to do is if you have a long string and you want to split on a certain amount of characters, but you don't want to break a word in half, it allows you to say, break on the nearest word before this number of characters. Because originally I was creating this fancy while loop and I'm like trying to split on spaces and stuff and rebuild the string. And I was like, something I thought was simple ended up being like 10, 10 to 12 lines of code. And I'm like, this is, there's gotta be a more Pythonic way. And this is another thing about finding help there's pound Python on Freenode. If you have any questions at all, feel free to ask in there. They're very helpful, unlike some other channels, um, where they're, I don't know, I'm not really gonna get into that, but the idea is like, it's a very warm community, and they, you, you can literally ask anything, they're not gonna tell you the RTFM, really, so they're, they're very friendly about that. But in all honesty though, if you do have a question, Google first, Google's your answer first. You're more welcome to allow to, to contact me if you still wanna learn anything else. Um, like I said, my GitHub is slash Amiano, and you guys saw my domain name is yanovich.net uh, when I was SHN in my box. If you guys have any questions at all, anything at all, just pull my website, my email address is on there, my GitHub's on there, check out my code. And I use Python for almost everything. I think like 99% of every, all my projects on GitHub are Python, except for stuff I forked, like that I haven't really contributed to. Like, you know, you want to follow a project, so you fork it instead, and you're like, oh, I'm eventually going to contribute to this someday, but when I get around to it, and I, yeah, I have a lot of projects like that. Like my to-do list, like when I get around to it, but I'm sure if you're really into coding, you'll come across that, but um, general Python help. The Python docs are fantastic. The help function, Python, um, pound Python free. Now there's, there's lots of resources for help, lots of books, dive into Python. There's also how to think like a computer scientist Python version that teaches you Python and teaches you computer science at the same time. So it's very powerful, very useful. Um, if you want, uh, I'll talk to Eric and I might try to send out an email to the mailing list about like some resources for learning Python that I've routed off. Because if you really want to listen, you don't feel like writing it down or somewhere, you're just gonna find it on your own, whatever, that's fine. But I uh, just want to make sure you guys are aware there's, there, the resources are out there if you want to expand your knowledge and keep going with Python, which I really encourage everyone to do with Python, because I originally picked it up 
I think in 08 or 09 at Pi, Ohio. And I've just rolled with it since. It's been my predominant language for writing everything. Like, if I, in fact, it's actually kind of scary. Every time I uh, try to solve a problem in another language, I'm, I, I start thinking natively in Python. Like, why can't I just do like an accessor to get a substring out of a string instead of doing the, like the dot s u b r thing in PHP and specifying my ah oh, yeah. So it's it's yeah it's Python's awesome. Use it, love it, learn to appreciate it. Final words. <laughs> Thank you.